This week we chat to Avalanche Studios about Mad Max, out now for PC, PS4 and Xbox One. We review brand new old school RTS Act of Aggression and Johnny Robot catches up with Bethesda Softworks to talk about upcoming multiplayer fighter, Battlecry. This is Player Attack. Hi, I'm Jessica Citizen, and we're kicking off this week with some Australian-centric news. First up, former Parramatta Eels NRL star Jared Hayne has achieved a couple of major milestones. First, there's that little matter of securing a spot on the San Francisco 49ers 53-man NFL roster in the United States. Haynes made a ridiculously good impression on the fans too, to the point where his number 38 jersey is the highest selling shirt on the NFL online store. But and this second point is technically related to the first, he has also reached another major career achievement. The Aussie is set to appear in Madden 16, the latest game in the series that inspired him to jump from rugby to gridiron. He's not a member of the in-game 49ers roster just yet, but you can find him as a feature player in the Madden Ultimate Team Mystery Box, and he's got some very impressive stats. There's more good news for Down Under Gamers. Ubisoft has confirmed that Tom Clancy's Rainbow Six Siege will indeed be getting dedicated local servers hosted in Sydney. They will be up and running for the game's closed beta when it starts a little later this month, and the publisher is promising an optimal online experience when the game launches in December. But it's not all fun and games. Steam has bundled up a great little collection of things for Mad Max fans. All four of the cult classic films, including Fury Road, plus a copy of the brand new game. However, despite the film's strong ties to Australia, the bundle is not available here. Instead, we can buy the game all on its lonesome. Sure, it's the sort of thing we're used to by now, but this one really does kind of sting. Anyway, it was also a big week for patches, with Minecraft getting a few nifty tweaks and changes to its PC version. The official change log includes references to rebalancing armor, a stack of optimizations, fixes to some mob-related AI bugs, fishing rod improvements, and a promise that the world may corrupt slightly less times now, or slightly more. The team at Mojang doesn't actually seem quite sure. Snapshot 15W36C is out now, six years after the game's initial release, and it looks like something you should grab pretty quickly. This next update for PC is a bit more of a surprise though. Warner Brothers is claiming that Batman Arkham Knight is actually playable now on Windows, thanks to this new interim patch. It's been in the works for a while now and promises to reduce frame rate hitches, optimize memory, improve GPU performance, fix texture bugs, and tidy up some hard drive bugs. There is a slight problem though. The only people who can actually try this one out are those of you who bought Arkham Knight before it was pulled from retailers for being so horribly broken. If you missed it then, you are still going to miss out. There is no word yet from the publisher about just when the Batman will return to stores. Something that will be playable on a slightly more concrete date is the beta test for Star Wars Battlefront. EA has announced that things will kick off in early October. You can expect a quite technical test across three gameplay modes. There's a survival mission on Tatooine where you must fight back waves of Imperial forces, a 40-person multiplayer battle between the Empire and the Rebels on the icy planet Hoth that does give you a chance to play as Darth Vader and Luke Skywalker, and there's also a new mode called Drop Zone that is currently a little bit of a mystery. And speaking of beta tests, World of Warships has now been thoroughly tested, so you can pick that one up for free on September 17 and enjoy some high seas battles with more than 80 historical vessels covering a variety of seafaring nations. We'll have a proper look at that one next week as we celebrate the international launch. Metal Gear Solid 5, The Phantom Pain, launched around the world this week, and as you could probably expect, it has topped the charts around the world. We don't quite have a console breakdown for all reasons just yet, but it seems that in the UK at least, Snake fans are also PlayStation fans, as 72% of all console copies of the game sold were on PS4. 22% were on Xbox One, 3% on PS3, and just 2% on Xbox 360. These numbers do only represent physical copies sold, but unless Xbox gamers are also big fans of downloading their games, we're thinking it's probably a universal trend. Of course, this does make it particularly upsetting to note that while the Phantom Pain suffered some slight launch issues, they were worst on the PS4. If you notice the Merc with the mouth popping up again, you're not seeing things. Activision re-released Deadpool back onto Steam, PSN and the Xbox Store in July after removing the game and all other Marvel titles back in 2013. 
Now Deadpool is available on new gen consoles, showing up on both PS4 and Xbox One as a digital release. If you missed it the first time around, now's your chance. In other news, Phoenix Wright is making a comeback with Ace Attorney 6 confirmed for a Western release. More details are expected at this month's Tokyo Game Show, so stay tuned unless you have any objections. And finally this week, the usual movie news tidbits. A trailer from the Warcraft movie has escaped from a closed door screening and while it's been filmed off of a screen and is in terrible quality, what we've seen looks pretty shiny indeed. Early critics may have dismissed the planned mix of CGI and live action, but how else were the team going to bring those orcs to life? In addition to the undated Mighty No. 9 movie in the works for digital platforms, it looks like Inafune's other blue boy is potentially headed to the big-ish screen. Rumours have surfaced that 20th Century Fox and Chernin Entertainment are reportedly working with Capcom to turn a Mega Man storyline into a film. Absolutely no details have been attached, so let your imagination run wild. It's a video game tie-in movie. How could you possibly be disappointed? For more information on any of these stories, or to keep up to date with the latest gaming news, head to playerattack.com. But for now, stick around, we've got plenty more still to come. few years there has been a real lack of good new real-time strategy games. You know the ones like the old Red Alert, Command & Conquer or Company of Heroes. Sure, we have had some new expansions and sequels come out, but nothing we could really call brand new games. However, Active Aggression is going out of its way to change that. A little context here. I have not played Active Aggression. This is not my review. It's from our producer. He's got a history of playing the old school strategies, things like Warcraft, Red Alert and Command and & Conquer, and he has been complaining literally for years about the lack of good real-time strategies. When he heard there was a new game on the market, he jumped at the chance to play and wouldn't let anyone else get close. But back to the game. You could say that Active Aggression is the bastard love child of the old Westwood Studio games, bringing back all the old gameplay and showing its love of the genre. It's a near future war strategy game, so as you might expect, you're given the choice of a number of factions, each with their own unique units, ranging from soldiers to light vehicles to heavy artillery. Whether you're playing as the Chimera, the US Army or the Cartel, each group has its own strengths and weaknesses, just like you'd expect from a solid RTS. To start with, there is the single player side of things. Traditionally, this is the way to learn the strengths and weaknesses of your units before you hop online and get destroyed by undoubtedly better players. Everybody out, and quick! Enemy detected. Honestly, this was a little disappointing. The story was a little hard to follow. It was the usual variation on someone is doing something bad to someone else, so we must stop them. And that makes sense. But the story is told through a mosaic of information, including news reports and voice chats rather than straight up exposition. Each one does have its own unique flavour, but added together it was kind of all over the place and pretty hard to follow. Once you get past the story element, there is the learning curve. In a traditional RTS, you are introduced to the units bit by bit over the course of the game. This is also true in active aggression, however there is very little here to guide you on which ones to use when. Sure, there's the occasional suggestion, but overall you're just thrown in the deep end with four cinder blocks tied to your ankles Enemy and told detected. to swim. I spent more than a few rounds being torn apart by enemies only to discover that I had a new unit in my collection that tidied up the entire level. Once I discovered the best unit for the task, winning things became much easier. This does show a lacking storyline when you look at how it teaches you to play the game. And then there's the multiplayer element, which is very solid. It's not perfect, but it is solid. As you might expect in a multiplayer RTS, you are going to get hurt until you work out the details of the gameplay. There is a steep learning curve here too, however the things are mostly balanced. That said, there are one or two gripes. Firstly, some of the units look too similar. There are multiple types of light vehicles, however when you're in combat it's 
pretty difficult to tell which one's which, which can lead to you sending in something to designed to destroy buildings when really you need an anti-aircraft weapon. That is an easy enough fix if you Gen Systems wanted to update the graphics. The bigger issue? Resources. Now I hate to compare this indie game to one of the most solid RTS out there, but bear with us, it is the easiest way to explain the issue. The main resource in Command and Conquer was the alien mineral Tiberium. This was always limited on the map, and yes, you could run out. However, once a Tiberian field did run out, it would slowly regrow, which would prevent a stalemate at the end of the game. In Active Aggression, however, the main source of resources is through mining, which also runs out. You can gain a small amount of resources from capturing buildings or enemies and healing your own team, but it is limited and prevents you from building too many units. This will inevitably cause stalemates. It takes a fair amount of units to take out a well-fortified building or a base, so I can see you throwing many small units at them only to see them be destroyed with little effect. Over and over and over. I also found out that these resources ran out almost every game I played well before I was ready to mount an attack. Although I didn't enjoy the single player as much, I did enjoy the multiplayer, which really is the main part of the game. It does have some issues, but most RTSs do when they first come out. It's all about balance, and it really does take a large user base to get that right. I would like to see the resources improved, whether that means more mines or just more stuff in them. Active Aggression really is one of the first old school RTSs to come out in a long time, and if you love them, then after trying this one out, you'll love it too. It is a good game, but with a few changes and an active user base, it could really be a great one. Out here, there are no heroes. No gods. No saviors. I'm Johnny Robot here at Warner Brothers, and we are looking at Mad Max. I know it's already exciting, it's Mad Max, but let's hear a little more about it. So tell me, what is the game about? Well, uh, high level Mad Max is a an, an huge open world action adventure. Like, from Avalanche Studios, so you kind of know what to expect right there. It's set in a post-apocalyptic universe, made famous by the films, but it's a, it's a standalone game, a standalone experience with original characters, original storyline, and a world handcrafted from the ground up to rival the best open worlds out there. And something's been toted around a lot is it's lots of vehicle customization, lots of vehicle combat. So could you go into a little bit more about that? Sure, yeah, I could, I could talk for hours. I mean, uh, essentially your journey is uh, the, the warlord in the wasteland, Scabarus Scrotus, again a unique unique character from the Mad Max universe. He, uh, he and his war boys strip Max of his uh, famous interceptor at the start of the title, leave him for dead, uh, beat him up, and uh, he manages to survive with the help of a few friends. And then ultimately your journey in the game is putting back together a vehicle so Max can get out, escape the wasteland and find some peace of mind in the Plains of Silence. So you as a player, you'll play Max and you have to uh, figure out what your driving style, what your combat style, what you know underlying chassis you're going to choose for your vehicle. We call it the magnum opus, your great work. And you get the help of a, a, a hunchback mechanic, a quite sort of disturbing character called Chumbucket. Uh, he's a he's a black finger of the wasteland, he, and he treats vehicles almost as a religion. Um, so he helps you fanatically putting together this uh, the, the, like most badass wasteland war machine that anyone has seen, uh, and that's essentially your journey to, to sort of customize and make your own choices about what vehicle you want, and to see what kind of encounters and what kind of um, camps and and convoys and other types of encounters that you're going to take on. Uh, do components, do you find them around the world, do you strip them off other things, is it basically find stuff and just shove it on your chassis, or is there another kind of element to that? Uh, a bit of both, there's, there's a, a number of different elements, so one is definitely that you can find um, uh, particularly trophies from taking down a convoy, for example, the convoy leader might have had a skull or some sort of trophy, his symbol, 
and you can use that as decoration for your car, um, which is also true to the, the uh, vehicles in Fury Road. They're very, you know, when you don't have much time in the wasteland, you spend time making these ornately crafted decorations out of skulls and scrap metal and so on. Uh, in other mechanics, you can uh, find project parts, which help you. Uh, you, you tend to uh, try to build alliances with certain stronghold leaders in the wasteland. And as you work for them, it's not, I mean, Max wouldn't really work for someone, but it's a mutual trade agreement, if you like, an, an uneasy alliance. Uh, and you can help further the development of their strongholds, and they will then help you craft uh, weapons or upgrades or new tires or whatever. So there's a number of different ways to, to uh, sort of come by the upgrades for your, for your vehicles. When Max is out of the car, I assume he kicks just as much ass as well? He does, yeah. He's a, an efficient fighter, brutal fighter. He doesn't pull any punches, so um, he, he will do what it takes to survive. So we have a brawling style of mechanic um, where uh, we, we have tried to do something that feels right for Max. It's heavy, it feels like he's, every punch he's fighting for his survival. Um, and then we also have a, a, an interesting take on that where he's got a fury meter. The better you play, the quicker you will fill up this fury meter. And then once it's full, you'll go into fury mode where he's, he's just like an adrenaline rush that just makes him totally unstoppable uh, and he can clear an arena in minutes. Now, some of the most important questions are the simplest of questions. So Mad Max, very synonymous with two things, a double barrel shotgun and a dog. Can we expect those two things? Yes, is the short answer. Yeah. So his iconic shotgun is one of the things that uh, doesn't get stripped from him. Um, he actually it does get stolen, but he finds it again because it's been uh, he, he has a tussle on, on uh, Scrotus's vehicle. It gets lost and he picks it up again with the help of the dog. So both of those are elements in the game. Yeah. Just hitting every single point here. This is what I want to hear. And other other words than well, the interceptor. Is it salvageable or is that top secret still? That is something that we're not divulging as this part of the campaign. So you'll have to play probably through the, the whole game to figure out what happens with the Interceptor. It was really important for us that you as a player, we want you to feel like you're Mad Max. Um, it, the film is interesting in the sense that there are sort of multiple heroes, but really it's, he's, he's an iconic anti-hero. He's almost the first you know, really strongly uh, presented anti-hero from at least from my memory of, of you know early days so uh, it was important for us to give the player the ability to, to play as Mad Max and, and really experience his story there's only those who live those who die and those who stand in my way rated M for mature Lucas, what has changed since we last saw Battlecry? A lot of things. So, you know, we, we went to Alpha in Australia, got a ton of great feedback. So, uh, since last time you've seen the game, we actually reduced the number of players. So, our, our big teams are now 12v12. Our small teams, we have 6v6 for a really intimate experience. Uh, we made lots of changes to our war zones to really accommodate that. Uh, we've got a whole new progression scheme in the game. So, as a warrior, you can get to you know, 10 levels of rank. You can build loadouts. You can unlock skills completely change how your warrior plays so a lot of dynamic stuff has gone in uh, we've added a couple more more warrior classes to the game so we now have five uh, warrior classes up and running in the game uh, and just a lot of just you know moment to moment changes a lot of great art improvements a lot of amazing animation improvements uh, and more and more for those that don't actually know what battle cry is give me a broad overview yeah, so Battle Cry is a tactical action combat game. So it's really all about taking that brawler action combat that you've, you know, a lot of times you see in single player and bringing that in the multiplayer space. So it's third person, extremely fast, highly animation driven. Your warriors constantly running around, executing combos, amazing over the top abilities, you know, mantling, grappling, and just flying through the level. We were lucky enough to get the Alpha in Australia. What did you learn from the Alpha? 
Uh, tons of great stuff. So, you know, uh, one of the big reasons we kind of moved the, 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 the size of the, the teams down was, you know, players were just a, a little bit too confused by our massive war zones. And, you know, when it was 32 players, there was just a little bit too much to take in. So by reducing that down, we really found that players were able to still have these epic battles, but still have a really good mind map of uh, the size of the war zone, where everything was, and where their team was. That 6v6 intimate hunt and kill, love it. But I came across something new. Who are the Huns? So the, the Han Republic is the, the third faction that we wanted to announce, and they really kind of represent, you know, the, the Chinese, Korean, and, and Mongolian empires. They've kind of band together as a faction, representing the war zone for their, you know, their political needs and interests in the war zone. Something else has changed as well is there's a new progression and character building. Yeah, so we, uh, we now have you know, 10 ranks of uh, progression for each of the warriors. Uh, you're able to build up through our Mento system, uh, unlock you know, several skill slots. Uh, we have tons and tons of skill. I think it's uh, something like 600 combinatorial for each warrior class uh, that you can go in and radically change. So uh, as a you know, gadgeteer, you have an aeroscope that reveals enemy's positions. You might change it out so instead of like, revealing the enemy, instead it confuses the enemy and shows them you know, your team uh, at false positions on the map. or you might change you know one of your minds to, to be like a sentry turret um, lots of interesting changes like that as a enforcer you can get back health when you do adrenaline burst now, a lot of really interesting mechanics like that now I jumped in and I was playing the uh, the glass ca glass cannon opportunistic killer the uh, infiltrator for those coming into it for the first time, who do you reckon you'd recommend as a good starting character? So the, the Enforcer's a tank character. Sometimes he's a good class to start with just because he has that extra health. You stay alive, alive a little bit longer and you're able to kind of learn the map. But as you learn the war zones and as you learn where to stand, that really opens up play for characters like the Infiltrator or even the Ranger. You know, the, the, the Ranger is a really excellent range class, but it's all about using the verticality of the map, knowing you have a grapple nearby, ha having an escape strategy as the Ranger is key. But as long as as you do, you're, you're going to be able to do, do devastating damage. Let's go back to that. That grapple system, it's pretty original for a game like this. Go into that more, man. That verticality is crazy. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, the, the grapple system is a, is a great example of just the amazing team we have at Battlecry. So, ton of autonomy, a ton of creativity, uh, and it's just an idea that independently, like, you know, over over our first year of Battlecry, several people came and said, hey, have we ever thought about a mechanic like this? I think it could work. And, you know, we finally crossed that threshold, like, all right, enough people have come to me. There's got to be something here. Yeah, let's throw it in the game. And I think, like, our first Christmas break, we just we threw it in the game. It worked out absolutely amazing. And I mean, just put huge smiles on everybody's face, and that, that was it. It was like, okay this absolutely works for the game it's here to stay and and it's just improved and improved since then what kind of feedback have you had from the competitive space in this one are you feeling kind of like an esports vibe to this as well uh, absolutely and I mean that's something we're gonna let the community really build and kind of grow organically uh, but we are hearing that from a lot of our fans so at a lot of the consumer shows where we get you know big groups sitting down especially anytime we get like you know clans and guilds to sit down uh, it's amazing to see the strategy that forms out I mean there's you know we play the game every single day at battle cry we play just Every single day, where the clan sit down, and within five minutes, it's like, holy crap, we didn't, we never even thought of that, you know. So amazing things that have been coming out of that, and then watching, watching the alpha play and a lot of the strategies building there. We've talked a lot about the mechanics in it, and it obviously comes a lot from you as the design director. Where did you get your inspiration for some of these? Uh, so, you know, a lot of it's just checking out the, the brawler space. Like I said, we were really inspired by, you know, the, the single-player brawler games, things like God of War, you know, the Arkham series, uh, even Devil May Cry were a lot of kind of the core inspiration that, and, and just thinking, like, how can we just take the, the amazing years of progression that have happened in brawler and bring that into the competitive space and still make it feel, you know, fun and accessible and just, uh, you know, like, those games put a huge smile on my face, and that's what I wanted. It's like, yeah, we're competitive, but at the end of the day, what can we do to build a game that you, you you win lose or draw you just have this big smile on your face and you had these epic amazing moments in the game what can we expect next from battle cry and uh when can we get our hands on it uh, so you know that's kind of one and the same so what's next for battle cry is we're we're moving into our beta so we're we're finishing up our alpha in australia we'll be moving into a beta phase and we'll be doing a, releasing the beta worldwide this year in 2015 so players can sign up at uh, battlecrythegame.com get into the beta and they'll be one of the first to let in
that's about it for this edition of Player Attack. Thanks for watching. Next week, we head off to the Seven Seas for a look at World of Warships, which is finally ready to launch. While Johnny Robot finds out more about the latest Tom Clancy experience, Rainbow Six Siege. In the meantime, you can catch us on playerattack.com. We are on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. And if you've got something you want to say, send us an email, mailbox at playerattack.com, or just hop on our forums. Till next week, I'm Jessica Citizen, and this is Player Attack.